here, uh, Amvest Capital in New York City. Welcome to the Amvest Capital Inc. live webinar with Anaconda Mining. Anaconda trades on the bench on the TSX main board, excuse me, it's ANX and it's ANX GF on the OTC uh, QX. We do hope you enjoy today's program. Uh, it'll be available in replay mode about an hour and a half after we uh, finish up. A few housekeeping uh, points. Um, do ask questions of management. Highlighted that uh, ask questions of management box. Send them in and we'll ask them. Um, also, here are some important links. Uh, if you want to get a copy of this presentation or check out stock pages, things like that. And then um, during the show, email it, put it on social media, whatever. Uh, it'll be the link to the live and the link will also work later for the replay. So uh, please uh, share the love there. Um, Amvest, of course, is a New York-based specialist management corporate finance firm focused solely on the natural resource sector. Um, as note, as always, this this call is most definitely for informational purposes only. Um, got two great guys from the company: Kevin Bullock, President and CEO, Director, and Robert Dufour, uh, the CFO. And uh, they're both going to be tag teaming a great presentation and update. We haven't done this since uh, March, I believe. And uh, then we'll open it up to Q&A again and please send in questions. So uh, take it away, guys. All right. Thanks very much, Campbell. Happy to be back on and uh, update all your viewers. Um, as uh, many of you know, and some of you who are new, we're, we're concentrating in Eastern Canada at the moment. We have production in Newfoundland. Uh, between 15 and 20,000 ounces a year over the last 10 years or so. And we have quite a large development project in Nova Scotia that we're moving forward, which we'll be happy to spend a bit more time on today's presentation. There will be some forward-looking statements. Um, this slide is available on our website if people wish to view it, uh, but I will be talking about the future. The future, And uh, as you know, with COVID and everything else, things may happen, as I say, or differently uh, moving forward. <clears throat> We've basically... Um, a couple of years ago, two to three years ago, Rob and I got together and put together a very aggressive platform for growth, targeting 150,000 ounces of gold production, um, trying to get there in the next three to five years. And it sounds like quite a big jump from our current um, under 20,000 ounces a year. But with the addition of the Gold Bro Gold project and the movement of that forward, uh, I'm happy to say that we are uh, executing on our plan and uh, we are seeing the, the light of day at the end of this large project, which will take you through and talk to you about. Um, we have a strong treasury and a robust balance sheet, um, having built up funds over the last several years with a, within a good gold price environment. Um, this year has been very, very difficult. We'll touch on that uh, as far as cash flow goes, um, but we are happy to, to be here and present and, and uh, say that we're back on track uh, with that moving forward. The Goldboro Gold Project is really the future of Anaconda. It's in the uh, in the northeast uh, part of Nova Scotia, almost uh, almost on the border with Cape Breton Island. And this is a very low risk jurisdiction. And, and quite honestly, to have a junior uh, hold a project with no encumbrances whatsoever, no no royalties, no JVs, no streams, um, this is fantastic for us. We've uh, we were happy to present to your viewers the last time we were on a new resource of closing in on 3 million ounces. And now we're happy to present the findings of a, of a PEA, uh, Preliminary Economic Assessment, demonstrating the robustness of the project that allows us to move forward with a feasibility study, which we expect to deliver the results at the end of this year. Um, the Point Roost project, again, 10 years of production, and that's provided cash flow for us to get this far with Goldboro. And, uh, quite uh, in the same, near the same spot, about 40 kilometers to the east of our producing asset in Newfoundland, which is the only permitted gold mill. We have our exploration property called Tilt Cove, which is a 35 kilometer strike length of a uh, greenstone belt that surrounds a past producing high grade gold mine. And we're looking for similarities that we can put through our, our mill um, on the island of Newfoundland. Um, we do have an experienced uh, mining and financial team that have uh, built mines before and put things into production and turned uh, companies around. I won't dwell on this, um, but uh, quite a good team that we're building up here, and we continue to do so. Lots of experience 
um, in this part of uh, development and into into production, development and production. I'll turn it over to Rob Dufour now, and uh, um, Rob can take you through the corporate structure in the next few slides on our, our financials. Thanks, Kevin. Um, as was mentioned before, we do trade on the big board and the OTCQX and X and Annex GF. Uh, on a fully diluted basis, we have 185 million shares outstanding. Uh, the warrants that you see there, we previously had a much bigger share, uh, share warrant overhang. Those have now actually all been cleared. So we are now very clean from a corporate structure perspective. We do have a cash position, at least as of Q2, uh, $14.6 million. As Kevin mentioned, we have a robust treasury. We do have challenges um, production-wise every now and then, but we're unique as a junior. We're able to absorb those and continue moving forward on growth. Uh, from a shareholder base, we've seen significant changes here, especially from institutional interest. Uh, you know, a couple of years ago, we might have had 5 to 8%. Now we're approaching 25% uh, with some recent uh, fairly large acquisitions from large institutional shareholders. So we see that continually getting larger. And we also see the institutional interest just from large mining groups so, for example, on the analyst coverage side, Sprott just launched on us about a couple of weeks ago. Um, they make that report available in addition to the other analysts that we have covering us. All of them at target prices well above where we sit now. And uh, we believe we'll have other very significant uh, institutional names coming on board. And really, the, the, the transformation there is the Goldboro Gold Project, which is becoming a world-class development asset. So I'll let Kevin spend some time uh, explaining what's changed since the last time we presented to this group. Thanks, Rob. So the Goldberg Gold Project, as I mentioned earlier, is in the northeast uh, portion of Nova Scotia. The entire uh, southeast, um, from, from south to north on the eastern side of the province of Nova Scotia, is referred to as the Maguma terrain. And uh, Maguma, simply meaning, or simply put, is these anticlinal structures um, that are stacked systems that build up the deposits in the area, of which there are several of them owned by Atlantic Gold, which was acquired by St. Barbara. Um, a couple of years ago now, maybe even three years ago now, two years ago now, um, for over $700 million. Goldboro is now by far the largest single deposit, uh, gold deposit uh, in the province of Nova Scotia. And it is the highest grade undeveloped open pit in Nova Scotia uh, with, with 1.1 million ounces of open pitable uh, gold. Um, so the project has changed in scope quite dramatically from the time we purchased this until now and uh, we're moving forward to feasibility um, by the end of this year. The resource itself, uh, again, in the open pit category, measured and indicated resources um, with very little inferred as we constrained our pits to measured and indicated. There is a bit of inferred in that uh, falls incidentally when you do that, and we have spent time drilling that. So um, we think we'll be through 1.1 million ounces of open pit material. The underground material, which is 50% measured and indicated and 50% inferred, um, needs to be infilled to bring up the category of inferred. And that's why we've chosen to take a route uh, of our feasibility study to do it in two phases. Feasibility studies cannot use inferred ounces, and therefore, because all of our ounces, uh, close to all of our ounces in the open pit, are measured and indicated, that's what we're doing our phase one feasibility on that's uh, going to be out at the end of this year. Uh, you'll see in, a, in some further slides that we don't start developing the underground until about year six from within the pits. And that gives us six years to do the phase two, which introduces the higher grade underground into the overall process of this combined open pit underground mine. The uh, results of the pr preliminary economic assessment, which by the way, it is allowed to use inferred resources. So this is what we feel the combined open pit underground scenario would look like. Uh, it's a $286 million initial capex to build a mine that's going to last at least 17 years. And uh, we have not drilled at depth or on strike, so there's a lot of opportunity uh, to significantly extend that mine life. But even so, that's quite a long mine life with, uh, with very good recoveries and of 96.4% uh, through a CIL plant, CIL-CIP plant. And that uh, recovery is actually at feasibility level already. Uh, this generates at a uh, $2,000 Canadian gold price, or $1,550 US, with the exchange rate we're using in the PEA, a $550 million after-tax net present value at a 5% discount, and an IRR approaching 25%. So fantastic numbers for us. Um, at today's price of gold, this would represent a 3-to-1 um, NPV to initial capital, which is a fantastic number. 
And on average, and I'll take you through the production profile, but on average, this is 100, over 100,000 ounces, 112,000 ounces a year for 17.6 years. This is a lot of gold production and uh, quite a long mine life. So it's a significant project for Nova Scotia. What we like most is the uh, cash operating cost and the all-in sustaining cost on average uh, coming in at 668 and 799 respectively. Um, most, uh, all seniors and mid-tiers and good producers of gold um, would love to be at under $800 an ounce all in. Um, generally, they're, they're between um, 800 and 1100. So uh, this is a very good project um, as far as the cash, uh, the financial components go. I'll turn it over to Rob now to just elaborate on that a little bit uh, from the next slide. Yeah, just going to a few details, and I think as Kevin alluded to there, you know, um, we were doing a feasibility study in parallel with a step change. We needed to do a quick PA, but but underlying all that is a lot of feasibility level work that fed into this. And part of that too is, you know, we plan on on releasing a feasibility study in just a couple months now, um, and we didn't want it to be drastically different. We plan on building this, uh, so we made it quite realistic. So life of mine, again, 17 and a half years. And as we'll demonstrate, we think this is going to be a multi-generational gold mine. There's a lot of exploration upside here. Uh, based on a 4,000 ton per day uh, processing rate, strip ratio of 6.6, .6, relatively high, but it's because it's one of the highest grade open pits uh, in eastern Canada, 2.86 grams per ton uh, in situ. Uh, we'll, the initial capital cost is about $285 million. That includes $45 million uh, of contingency. And that's an important number because for a company of our size, uh, that's feasible. We can build that. Uh, that's an important point. And the ratio of NPP to initial CapEx is almost double, which is excellent. Uh, today's gold price is much higher than that. And we've also built in our uh, sustaining capital costs as well, including a contingency on that. So in addition to the real costs we use, we also built in some conservatism. So we're, we're quite confident in this project uh, and in the numbers this is demonstrating. And at today's price of gold, 2200 uh, you know, th this project is, you know, sev over $700 million after tax, 5% NPV. Uh, and it's very robust to gold price. Certainly, if we get back to $2,400, $2,500 Canadian gold price, which we were at for quite a while, you know, we're starting to get close to a billion dollar project. But over a long mine life, it's important that it's, it can, it's robust to gold both ways. So gold could come off quite significantly, and it's still a very economic project. Looking at the infrastructure that we've come up with, it was a challenge for us um, with, the, um, with the rules and regulations in Nova Scotia to be able to put the infrastructure in such a design that it's a net benefit for the environment and for us technically and for us financially. Uh, and therefore, we had to do an alternatives assessment study of, of basically putting this in different configurations until we got one that was net benefit for all and uh, also keeping it within one single watershed. So what we managed to do is, is get quite a nice tight uh, a postage stamp um, surface area for the infrastructure, which is always more efficient to have it smaller than larger because of uh, haul, uh, haul distances, et cetera. So what we've ended up with is, is two open pits. The reason it's not one is because there's a lake that, uh, that comes uh, through the, two, the ore body to the south and therefore uh, we did not want to mine through it and try and dam it up. That would be um, not something we wish to do environmentally because this river goes to the ocean. Um, however, so we end up with two pits, but we don't sterilize the ore in between. We, we simply go for it by leaving a crown pillar or, or, or a, a large 50 meter piece of ground uh, below surface and then mine underground uh, for the ore. Uh, the 4,000 ton a day process plant is, uh, is over on the west side. Um, these large uh, pink areas are the waste piles of which we have to store at least 115 million tons of waste. And then the, the tailings management facility to the northeast uh, is going to hold uh, up to 20 million tons so far uh, of, of ore or tailings from processing the ore. And this ore is, is uh, potentially acid generating through our studies, and therefore this entire, um, this entire TMF or, or tailings management facility will be lined with geotextile material to protect the environment. Um, one thing we look at is, is where we're heading over time. Uh, we currently sit at a 0.3 or less um, nav at the moment. And, you know, when you look at our 
PEA, um, which shows the results that we've just discussed with you, um, it's very, very similar to the results of Marathon Gold's Valentine Lake feasibility study. Um, so we are, uh, we should be moving to the, to the left of this chart towards the value of Marathon. Um, however, we are uh, behind where Marathon is. Marathon's done their feasibility and we've only done a preliminary economic assessment. But our, feasi our feasibility will be out soon. Uh, this may look like a complicated slide, but it's not. The blue color is actually the open pit annual production of gold, and the gold color is the annual production from underground, and the black line is the cash cost, and the red line is the all-in sustaining cost. So as you can see, our first year of open pit is our highest grade. Um, it's usually the other way around. You have to wait till the bottom of the pit. Um, so that helps with payback, which is less than three years. And but what we do is we mine an average of 87,000 ounces a year um, for five years. And then um, in this area, um, in the, this area here is when we're developing the underground from within the pits. So you can see a very large jump in, um, in all in costs. Um, in this area, and that's because we're spending about $62 million this year from cash flow to start several ramps from within the pits to, to, um, to drive down to the ore bodies at depth uh, and in between the pits. We continued to do that in year seven. Uh, however, we're also driving drifts in ore in the underground workings and generating uh, ore from underground, but it's expensive ore as it is development ore and therefore both the all-in cost and operating costs go up. The next year from year seven on, that is when we're producing an average of 30, 137,000 ounces a year of open stoping underground and open pit mining and the cost drop dramatically down to very, very good levels and gold production goes up. In one year, we approach 200,000 ounces, but the average for the next 10 years is about 137,000 ounces a year. To look at it another way, um, one can easily see where we start the underground based on this sustaining capital cost bar chart. Um, this is um, where we start our ramps and spend $62 million out of cash flow. And you can see between um, cumulative cash flow and annual cash flow, we do not go negative. And then over the next 10 years, we blow through $1 billion of after-tax uh, revenue from this project. Quite an incredible project. Looking at this uh, diagrammatically, we have the two pits, uh, east and west, separated by the lake and river. And then we have the ramp systems that go in between the pits and at depth. We've drilled our deepest hole to 550 meters. The analogs for these types of deposits go for several kilometers around the world. So there's a lot of room uh, at depth, down dip, and, and, um, and, and down plunge. Um, so we look forward to, over time, as we're mining the open pits, really understanding the, ground, the underground more, drilling it off from within the ramps, and um, changing inferred to measured and indicated category, so that by the time year six comes around, we have phase two of the feasibility done, which introduces the underground mining. What really excites us most is when you look at our entire land holding. We can see here the pits uh, east and west uh, straddled by the lake, which comes through the south. However, west of the west pit, all the way to the end of our boundary is about 1.5 kilometers. And the, geo the geophysical trend, which is a VLF survey, you can see here in hot pink, which identifies the, um, the type of uh, conductivity that we see and where our pits are um, shows us going all the way to the west to another past producing mine from the gold, uh, Goldboro days called Dolliver Mountain, which were with several shafts mining these anticlinal systems um, that, uh, that we see within our pits. So this entire area here, uh, we have not drilled any holes and that leaves a lot of room. As you can see, it's about the same size as our two pits already. So yes, uh, we're going through 3 million ounces on the east side of our property, but what's happening out here? We know the mineralization continues, but the only way to know if there's ore there or mineralization that's of value and holds together is to drill it. And that's what we plan to do as soon as we get the permits. We do have the budget to do it, 
We're just waiting for drill permits to come in. We'll first do an IP survey, which will pinpoint the nose of these anticlinal systems better, and then we'll drill our, uh, we'll set up our drill targets and start drilling. So it, we think we'll have a lot of excitement while we're, while we're continuing to permit the east side of our property with drilling to the west. So our next steps, uh, finish this definitive feasibility study by the end of the year. That will give us all the information we require to put together a very robust and detailed environmental assessment registration document, the EARD, which is the most important document, describing the project to the government agencies. There's then a review period uh, that lasts for anywhere from one series of, of questions and answers with three months of responses to four. And that's a six to 18 month period. We're guiding 18 because it's a large project and we think it'll take the entire uh, four sets of, of questions and responses. Um, to get our final permits to start building. So that would make us shovel ready in mid 2023, and it'll be about a two year build. So this will be the next gold mine built in Nova Scotia. And we're quite excited about the uh, prospect of uh, many more ounces and many more years beyond what we're seeing already with further drilling. I'll turn it over to Rob now to talk a bit about uh, about Newfoundland and our operations there. And then we'll get into uh, the issues we've had and how we're acting uh, and reacting to it. Yes, thanks, Kevin. And I think most people in this call know Newfoundland's been the hotspot for exploration over the last 12 months, uh, massive amounts of dollars coming in. And, and we think we're extremely unique uh, in the, the, this hot area. We have infrastructure, the only uh, producing gold mine uh, miner on the uh, on the, the island, uh, as well as we have the Chilco Gold Project, which we'll talk about, which we think is second to none with respect to all these these exploration plays out there. Um, it is a relatively small operation, but for a junior, especially with a massive development uh, project like Goldboro, we're unique because this, although small production, does generate free cash flow. And that means we don't have to go to the market every nine months to keep the lights on issuing cheap stock. We have rarely needed to go to the market for hard dollars. Uh, and so we've minimized dilution to our shareholders, of which... Uh, we, both of us, are quite significant. One of the most valuable things we have, and I, I mentioned the infrastructure, uh, is the big hole in the middle. This is our Pine Cove uh, mill facility and, and tailings facility uh, in the Point, Point Roos operation. That in, pit, uh, with that in pit facility was the old Pine Cove pit. It's since mined out and is now a fully permitted, fully operational in pit tailings facility. That has 10 years of uh, mine, uh, sorry, capacity for tailings. Environmentally, there's nothing better you could have to build something like that in Canada. I mean, it would take you three to five years just to permit it, but then you'd be looking at 30, 40, 50 million dollars in capital just to build. So tremendously valuable for any ore we find, we can fast track from a discovery to development. And we've done that many times over the last 10 years uh, at Point Roos, and we are aggressively uh, exploring in the area and we continue to plan to do so. Um, from a, so for you know 2020 last year, just to demonstrate you know the the powers, you know we did 18,200 ounces of gold production for mid tier. That's a rounding error uh, for us. That resulted in uh, operating cash flow from operations of 14 million dollars Canadian. Remember that's after corporate, that's after all the overheads. So that's money that we can take and then put back into our aggr aggressive growth growth strategy, which is really going to drive the value in this in this company. Uh, this year, we are moving on to the Argyle project, and you know we've had some. As people have been watching, we've had some initial challenges um, with, with the uh, getting it up and going, as you typically do, uh, because we have small pits. That does impact us much more because we don't have much long mine life from any individual pit. Uh, we, our current guidance sits at sixteen to seventeen thousand ounces. We are reviewing that as part of our Q3 results. Uh, and but we are setting ourselves up very well for next year with continued production from Argyle uh, and also with continued um, mining at Stogger Tight, which is looking like it's going to be our next mine. I might turn it over to Kevin as well to provide any other further color on that firm. Yeah, I'll just stay on Argyle for a while. So the first quarter, as, as people that follow this story or own stock in this story, um, we had a very difficult quarter in uh, starting up a new pit. We mine these small uh, pits that surround uh, the, the mill, and we keep finding more of them. Uh, but as people in the mining industry know, it takes it takes a few months up to a year to understand a deposit as you're as you're open pitting it, and then you get it right and you move on uh, with your mine plan, such as Goldbro. Uh, you know, with 10, 10, 10 years of open pit. We don't have the benefit of of long mine lives here. As a matter of fact, these pits are uh, mine lives are measured in months. So. 
we have to act very, very quickly to get it right. So the, the first quarter was uh, issues with um, organics because of the first benches and, and the root systems and soils mixed with the ore. Um, and then um, the second quarter, um, we were coming out of, out of uh, winter and, and uh, into the spring thaw, and we were having issues with frozen ore, frozen stockpiles, um, issues with the crusher going down because of that, um, you know, rehandling issues um, a- until we got to the third quarter. Um, so the third quarter, um, which we're in now, uh, the results will be out over the next uh, month or so, um, month or couple of months. You know, we've had, we've continued with issues of understanding the ore body now that we've got through the troubles in the first two quarters. And uh, just today, um, we reviewed the mine plan as it sits and are very comfortable that, um, that this quarter has been really a development quarter. Almost all of the work we've done, and, and we did issue in a press release that we're doing a lot of waste movement. We're speeding up and doubling the amount of equipment in the pit and, uh, and moving the waste to get the mine plan right to attack the ore body as we see it now and as we recognize it now. So we're convinced that uh, that the fourth quarter and next year specifically are going to be extremely good year. Uh, it's going to be extremely good year next year uh, with a grade of over two grams. So, um, you know, we're quite comfortable with that. It has taken us time. We are disappointed with uh, with how we've done at the mine site and we've reacted. We've got new people and uh, we're very, very happy with the amount of waste movement we've done so that we can get this right for uh, starting next quarter onwards. Rob, anything to add? Nope, nothing further at this point. Thank you. Okay, moving on to uh, reserves and life of mine. Uh, that's always the question at uh, at Point Roos is is you've only always got two to four years ahead of you for the last ten years, and that's true. And it's it's getting harder and harder to find ore, um, but we continue to do so. And a highlight of that is uh, Stugger Type, which uh, which we've mined in the past, but we've since found uh, an extension to that with some very interesting numbers, uh, you know, between the four and, and 15 grams per ton over, over five to 20 meters in our original holes. That's still, since turned out to be more like our usual uh, grade, maybe a bit higher overall for the deposit that we're drilling off. Um, but this is certainly looking like it'll be our next mine after Argyle and add one to two years to the mine life again as we keep looking for these uh, small deposits around the mine. Uh, while we're trying to keep it going to get to the big prize, which is 40 kilometers to the east, the exploration where we're, we're doing around the past producing uh, Nugget Pond mine, which produced at almost 10 grams per ton. So if we can transition from our one and a half to two and a half gram per ton uh, small pits that we're at now to something uh, that's three or four times higher grade um, with very quali- good quality roads, trucking roads in between, um, we can actually fast track something to to production and, and, and add it to the low grade ore, which would considerably change the profile in Newfoundland. So we continue to explore at Tilt Cove uh, and we the drills will be turning again uh, near the end of this year uh, when the ground freezes up and we've we've identified even further targets than we already have. We have had some success. We've had some drill holes that have that have hit uh, most recently five meters of five grams, that's a new discovery and needs to be followed up. And um, we're quite excited about following up on the Tilt Cove. So um, just highlight that we do have, um, that we have delivered our PEA. We hope to deliver the the feasibility by the end of the year. Uh, we have multiple targets at Tilt Cove and uh, we, we truly believe that Argyle uh, has turned around as of uh, the end of this year and, and into next year. Uh, could even be a record year for us at, at Argyle. Um, so we feel, you know, certainly uh, we put our money where our mouth is. We feel the current valuation is, a, is an optimal entry point for investors. Rob and I are not founders of the company, and we have, we buy alongside our shareholders whenever we're not blacked out. Um, so that really uh, opens it up back back to uh, the, the Q&A period if, uh, if anybody has any questions. Uh Indeed, we do. Everyone, please send in your questions. Just uh, type some notes in there. Ask a question of management. So we'll dig in. Um, does the production at uh, Point Roos um, back on track? Um, and 
did you anticipate that there could have been some issues uh, regarding different we, waters? We, we always plan according to the wireframe and modeling that we do based on exploration drilling. Uh, but once you get into actual mining, um, you're taking something, drill holes that are 20 to 25 meters apart, and you're mining with uh, with two and a half or three meter uh, production drill holes uh, benches. And ore bodies don't generally go on a straight line. So, but but all you can do when you're planning is is straight lines between the exploration holes. So when you really get into it, uh, you really need a few months to sort out what the ore body really looks like in real time and and in reality. And, and that's what took us time um, at the beginning. Then we realized the way, the way it was shaping up was a little different than we expected, and therefore we had to change uh, our mine plan. Um, so we engaged a, a group that is actually doing our feasibility study in, uh, in Nova Scotia uh, to look at this in more detail and do a new mine plan, which, uh, which we're expecting the final, uh, the final numbers on uh, this week. And we have been in order to change around to to mine that type of mine plan we've had to do a serious amount of of waste development uh to get it right so this quarter has been mostly waste development and that has uh that has made us go to um the low grade ore stockpiles from from pine cove uh for the mill combined with bits of of uh, of ore from from argyle so we're quite you know we don't you can't plan you can't plan these things you have to see them as you open the pit and then adjust accordingly and we've adjusted very well we've made some changes we've uh, we've changed equipment we've changed uh, the way we go in with the ramp and we're quite convinced we're doing the right thing now uh for next quarter and next year power um if you were to construct uh the mine today is there enough available power in the area yes because uh you know the biggest the biggest user of power at a mine site is the is the process plant. That's not changing. It's just a different area that we'll be getting the ore from. Um, so really, there's no additional power requirements per se. Oh, so uh, sorry. Was that sorry. a question for uh, for Point Roos or for Goldboro? Point, Point Roos. Yeah, that's what I. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, how much money spent on the ground after the June 2021 PEA? Uh, I would assume that that's at Goldboro or company wide. Uh, that would be uh, company wide for both. Yeah. So, so Rob. And God, actually, no, it's at Goldboro. No, to be specific. Yep. No, it's fine. You know, for for since June, so looking kind of towards the end of the year, as we work towards uh, really two major milestones: definitive feasibility study. Uh, in December, uh, and very soon after that, the environmental assessment document that we register, and that really gets the clock ticking on permitting. You know, between now and then, you know, we'll probably spend about five million dollars, maybe a little bit more, on feasibility and permitting level work. And a lot of that is our, our uh, things like geotechnical drilling, uh, wa water well monitoring, surface water and groundwater modeling, and all those inputs both both into uh, the feasibility study and the environmental. Uh, in the environmental assessment. Can you discuss how you look to finance your growth? Yes, well, we, we have the ability to, for, for exploration uh, and looking for new deposits to use our, the flow through, the Canadian provided flow through um, format. Um, we've raised significant funds with uh, flow through in um, deals that are uh, highly accretive to all our stakeholders because we do them at a premium to market. And that finances our exploration. We have been able to, and we believe we can continue to be able to um, provide, uh, get our growth and our um, feasibility and our EARD done with existing funds and cash flow from operations. Um, the point that we will need funds is when we do project financings to build Goldberg. Excellent. Thank you. Pass it over to Adam. Go in a little further detail. Oh, great. Thank you, Campbell. Uh, thanks, Kevin and, and Rob. A great presentation. Um, question um, for for Goldboro: um, Underground mining method uh, dilution. Uh, you know how how are you guys thinking about that? And um, and maybe uh, I don't know the the Atlantic Gold Mine uh, next door, but maybe. 
compare and contrast your plan to Goldboro with the with the mine next door. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much, Adam. Good to see you again. Um, so our, our ore body, when we go underground, it's different than the open pit mining because it's a different cutoff grade. So all we're mining is the higher grade zones of these stack systems rather than them and the halo around it. And therefore our grade goes up to somewhere between five and seven grams per ton. The width of those uh, can be anywhere from, um, uh, you know, 1.7 meters at the smallest being our minimum mining width up to 30 meters but the average width is 2.6. So it is conducive for long hole mining followed by, by paste fill, which is what we're looking at until we get to the crests, which would be cut and fill and drift and fill as you go from vertical to horizontal and back to vertical again over the noses. But that's also where the highest grade is. Um, so, so it works that way. Um, the second half of the question, just repeat it again, please. It was- uh, could, Sorry, if you dilution? could, uh, well, yeah, well, the second part is dilution, uh, both open pit and underground. You know, uh, um, you know, both your assumptions and and how you're going to minimize the dilution, and then and then part three would be compare and contrast Goldboro to to Atlantic the Atlantic gold mine. Yeah. So so for for the open pit, the dilution is a dilution model built in uh, with the dilution grades into the mine plan done by Nordman. Um, this is uh, this is based on we're going I believe we're going two and a half by two and a half by two and a half blocks. Um, we're mining eight meter benches, and the dilution I think works out to something like um, between fifteen and, and twenty percent. As we go underground, to be realistic, what we do is we use a skin or a layer of the hanging wall and foot wall the same width whether we're mining 1.7 meters or whether we're mining 30 meters wide. So that can be that can range anywhere from 10% uh, dilution to 60% dilution. And the average underground dilution works out to about 27%. And that's how we handle dil dilution underground is with an actual number on the hanging wall foot wall that'll come off with the ore. Whereas in the open pit, it's a planned uh, mining sequence uh, with blocks and dilution uh, built in plus then obviously uh, small mine dilution and mine recovery. The difference between us and Atlantic Gold is the difference between the two end members of the Maguma style system. So Maguma style systems uh, are all very, very similar in that they are stacked argillates and sandstones. Um, some of them, um, on one end member is where the noses are mineralized at quite high grade and they're quite small and the limbs pinch out within meters, sometimes centimeters, and the limbs are not mineralized, and there's not much of a halo around them. And that would be something like a, 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 the Dufferin style that they've tried to, to mine in the past, and it's very expensive mining. It's part of the mining that I just mentioned about what we'll have to do underground on the noses. It's development style mining, so high cost, um, but it's high grade as well. On the other end, the other end member is that you have quite a large halo and sometimes all of the, uh, the, the stacked systems uh, between argillites and sandstones being mineralized to some degree, but um, at a much lower grade. So it's almost like the grade width uh, multipliers are similar. So that would be Atlantic Gold's two koi deposit where they have, where they're mining. I think the rest of their mine life is somewhere just under a gram uh, um, that they're mining, but it's, but it's large scale. And that would be where the mineralization is in very, very large units of intercalated sandstones and argillates. We happen to be right in the middle with, with very high grade uh, noses and, and limbs. We've identified 69 of these zones. Um, they do continue at depth down the limbs to as deep as we've drilled at 550 meters. But then we have halos and mineralization around these zones um, within the sandstone and argillates. Uh, at a much lower grade, below a grade cutoff grade for underground, but, but well above a cutoff grade for open pit, which creates our first eight to 10 years of open pit mining. So we're in that middle layer. and that, So we're not exactly like uh, Tukoy, and we're not exactly like Dufferin. We're in the middle with the benefits of both and, and uh, the positives and negatives of both. And as you... Uh... As you go towards the uh, the west side of your property, towards that old mine, I, I apologize, Mount, whatever it was, I'm 
I can't remember. Does the style change at all? The Oliver Mountain. Well, we don't know. Um, we, you know, that was the late 1800s, early 1900s. We haven't been underground there. It's flooded. Um, you know, we only have diagrams of what they mined, but we don't have, we don't know what the mineralization looked like. Uh, but it was an operation with with quite a few openings and seven or eight shafts, so it must have been, it must have been something that was uh, that was doing well for them at the time. Um, we would assume it's uh, uh, well, we can't assume anything. We've got to drill it, so um, I can't answer that question until we we start doing more detailed work and get some drill holes into that area. Okay. Fair enough. But fair I, would, enough. I would assume because it's the same geotechnical or sorry, uh, geophysical signature um, that, you know, unless there's uh, any intrusives or dikes or anything going on, faults and offsets, and it's a different mineralization just that just happens to fit, that it would be similar. Well, they certainly couldn't have been mining, you know, one gram rock back in uh, the 1800s. So. No, definitely <laughs> not. I don't care how low their labor costs were. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, and um, maybe for the audience, uh, if you can uh, think off the top of your head of other deposits in Canada, you know, that are, you know, similar in style, uh, you know, within, uh, you know, banded iron formations that would give them, a, you know, other names to sort of tag along with, with Goldboro. Well, Goldboro is not a BIF. Um... Tilt Cove is the banded iron formation. That's the exploration oh, uh, property in Newfoundland. No, it's sandstones and argillites. So, um, right. really, there's not much like it in in Canada. But if you if you go to Australia, um, for instance, Fosterville is is you know it almost looks the same. And Rob, uh, you work there, Rob. I'm not sure if you have any more to add on that. No, I think the Bendigo Ballarat region in general, these these they call them saddle reefs, anticlinal systems, is there's the analog and then you know the geological age of the rocks is all very similar as well. And as we kind of mentioned earlier, these are known to go kilometers at depth. So you know, we've only drilled to five hundred and fifty meters and it's it's tremendously continuous and consistent at depth and we think it keeps going. We're not gonna go drill a one point, you know, two kilometer hole that's really expensive for something we're not gonna see for ten years. Uh, but it demonstrates, you know, you know, we keep talking about multi-generational mine because this this will keep going at depth. Okay, um, maybe a change change topic a little bit. Can you review the uh, the tax rates uh, that you're going to be subject to at uh, at Goldboro? Yeah, definitely. So I, uh, Goldboro, uh, the the provincial tax rate and Nova Scotia income tax rate is fourteen percent, and federal. Uh, is 15, so combined income tax rate of 29%. Uh, from a mining tax perspective, uh, the province of Nova Scotia eff effectively has a 1% royalty. It basically gets calculated as an NSR, so it's it's quite you know straightforward to to model. You know, based on our our our, our PA, um, we would see you know tax payments of upwards of I believe 480 million dollars. And I mean, we always want to minimize tax, but I think that also makes it a very you know, a compelling story uh, in in a region that's really looking for development. Geez, Nova Scotia is going to be getting a, a lot of money. Yep. I don't know what they're going to spend it all on. <laughs> um, uh, can you talk a little bit about your anticipated uh, mine mill availability and utilization versus the nameplate capacity? Yes, certainly. So in Newfoundland, our mill um, was originally designed for, um, after some upgrades, for, for 1,200 tons a day. We're now pushing through about 1,400 with some, uh, some, um, some technology and some, some infrastructure. And we are looking for a higher grade deposit at Tilt Cove in the banded iron formation that you discussed earlier. And those types of deposits, because it is a cross-cutting structure that hits the banded for iron formation, precipitates out the gold, and reduces the magnetic signature because it turns magnetite into an iron sulfide when it precipitates out the gold. These are generally because of cross-cutting structures that are perpendicular. They're like sausage-shaped deposits that go at depth. And therefore, just like the past producing uh, mine, it was a ramp access mine. To produce 1,300 tons a day on something uh, that's narrow and high grade uh, via ramps is, is quite difficult. So the mill is is uh, is well big enough for anything that we would find at Tilt Cove. The difference is 
the amount that we put through is is not what we're looking for. It's the grade of that amount. So, you know, I can't imagine producing more than, you know, unless we find something big, which is really big, which is possible or different. But if we find another nugget pond, um, that won't generate more than six to 800 tons a day. Um, and that can be blended with the lower grade stuff to fill the mill, or it can be just put through. But uh, remember, it changes the ounce production profile tremendously if we found another nugget pond and, and had eight or nine grams going through uh, a mill, even at half the, half the throughput, you'd be, you'd be, uh, you'd be triple with the production. You'd be up to 60, 70,000 ounces a year. Mm -hmm. and, so uh, it's, not uh, the, it's not the throughput that's the issue because this was built for small open pits. And what we're looking for is high grade uh, ramp access at Till Cove. Yeah. Yeah. And then at, at Goldboro, you know, considering the, you know, the, you know, your experience, um, you know, at Point Roos, as far as, you know, availability and, and, you know, weather and, and seasonality and whatnot, you know, what's, what's your anticipated, you know, again, mining and, and sort of mill availability versus nameplate capacity? Yeah, I think that we are, um, we're designing the mill in order to be able to expand if we need to, area-wise, not infrastructure-wise. Um, and the simple reason for that is, as I just said, it's, 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 it, the design is for the open pit. And if it was one open pit as opposed to two split by a lake, we'd have bigger equipment and a bigger throughput. Um, but we look at the size of equipment, what's best for uh, the mine as it sits right now. As you transition into the underground, that doesn't change anything because, again, uh, to do 4,000 tons a day from underground is, is not going to happen. We're going to get up to maybe 1,800 tons a day and mine the, um, the low-grade stockpiles at the end of the mine life in years uh, 15, 16, 17. Um, actually, I'll just, uh, I'll just point to that here. Um, so in this area, you'll see uh, that the blue is, uh, is, is a small number and a consistent number. That's actually low-grade stockpiles adding to what we're producing from underground. So 4,000 works out fine for this. The only time that would change and we'd have to expand is if we find more open pitable uh, ounces in this area, which is, uh, according to this diagram, the geophysical signature, the past producers, uh, a very good possibility. Mm. And that's when you'd up the throughput. Otherwise, uh, 4,000 tons a day is, is, uh, works for what we currently have. Yeah. yeah. And then realistically, do you think you'll get, you know, 90% uh, utilization on an average year or better? Oh, well, we're getting better than that at our mill in Newfoundland, and I'd assume we do as well or, or even better with a newer mill in Nova Scotia. Um, you know, there's uh, uh, we we have all the weather issues that that we'd have there in, in uh, northern Newfoundland. Um, we're used to this. We have some great people um, on our uh, on our process team, um, and we're designing this to be to be strong and to be uh, to get very good utilization. Um, so, you know, the ninety um, the ninety six point four percent recovery is going to be in a mill that's probably uh, moving towards ninety five percent availability. Or better. Excellent. Excellent. We, Let we me pass on. Believe, we, oh. we truly believe Go in ahead. preventive maintenance and not reactive maintenance. So we have some very good programs in place that keep the mills going and we can react quickly. Excellent. Excellent. Let me pass it on to Erdy if he's, if he's got any questions. Thank you. Just uh, one quick question. Uh, what What is the pre-production time for the Goldboro open pit and um, how thick is the overburden there? The overburden averages about eight meters, um, but it ranges from from two to, to fifteen. Um, the I think we have, uh, and I may I may have to check on this and get back to you, but I believe um, the pre-production can start within the end of the construction period, um, and it runs uh, I believe uh, not more than three months, but not more than six. Thank you. Because uh, the ore comes, the noses, the noses come right to surface in the area where we're starting mining, and that's why in our first year of production, it's the highest grade and the most ounces produced from the pit profile. Thank you, Campbell. Okay, um, just about 
wrapped up our time here and we have no more questions and we've got uh i think let's move move to close um i'll pass it back to to kevin and robert on that but uh before i do just uh please share your feedback uh you can do that there or when you check out but maybe you can do it right now as we uh chat here and um of course um those are the links and downloads and things and if you get a moment why don't you share this on social media so uh, i'll give it back to you guys and uh, maybe kind of wrap up uh, and give us the big picture and and uh we'll meet again Great. Thanks, Campbell. So I, I, I just want to address uh, uh, Doug Sutton asked a question about Paceville. Yes, we will be using Paceville, but the, the CapEx to spend on making a plant is, is well into uh, the open pit phase, so it'll be out of cash flow. David Laporte asked if there's any drill results to come. Yes, we'll be issuing drill results from drilling in between the two pits in gold throw uh, over the next little while. Uh, and then the last question I see here from a, a Don Drindak is, um, are we actively pursuing any M&A in Newfoundland? Uh, actively, no, but we're always talking to our neighbors and looking at other things that are being done. And a roll-up strategy in Newfoundland, I think, uh, will need to happen at some point uh, in the future. And uh, the main obstacles of this getting done are personalities, because you're talking about junior companies, and uh, you need a willing seller and a willing buyer or willing participants to do an M&A deal. So that's, that's the major obstacle there um, um, in that. To close, uh, and thanks for all the questions, to close, you know, we are a company that is, uh, we're achieving our goals. We're quite frustrated in our, in our um, inability to, uh, to get to the point we wanted to at Argyle, but uh, truly believe uh, we're there from fourth quarter on uh, and into a possibly record year uh, next year at Point Roos. And uh, we look forward to putting forward the, um, the Stogger type uh, resource in, in due time, showing that it'll be our next mine, increasing the mine life again all while we uh, put a feasibility out at uh, a robust feasibility out at Goldboro, uh, which really will turn the page for us. I think a lot of people think that uh, all PEAs are thumb socks. Uh, some are quite detailed like ours uh, because we did it in parallel with a feasibility and therefore it is, uh, it's almost like a pre-fees or, or better. Some of it is feasibility level. So it's, it's quite accurate and the front end of it, which is the open pit phase is what we should see in the first phase feasibility that comes out in December. Great. L lots to look forward to. Yep. Lots to look forward to over the next, uh, well, foreseeable future. All right. Uh, good day, everyone, and uh, please share your feedback. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.